Hey, Mark. Hey. <laughs> you have written um, a really interesting book. And it's a book that um, is going to make a lot of people mad. And frankly, it's a book that's going to make a lot of people madder than they should be. And I just want to lay out what the basic premise is and ask you to um, give a specific example or two of what is meant by what is actually. The, ba the back jacket copy of this book is better than on most books. They, whoever did this, maybe, maybe it was you, but somebody I think really... it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I this suspect it was me. The summary of the book is, is this. Um, this works perfectly. So, um, people often grouped under the umbrella term woke share more than a perpetual sense of grievance and attraction to street theater and an intense dislike of straight white guys who drink cheap beer and wear their baseball caps backward. <laughs> they share a devotion to subjectivism. Their gathering principle is the idea that subjective belief if it's heartfelt, trumps whatever objective, verifiable evidence may be brought against it. For these social justice warriors, if you sincerely and passionately believe an injustice is being done, then the effort to determine whether that belief corresponds with reality is a further injustice. So, this sounds like people who are clinically insane, and yet you're not referring to people who are clinically insane. They are thoroughly sane, usually highly yes. intelligent. How, what is, what are these people? What, what, what do they do? Well, I think, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a woman, a conservative author who was out on um, a book tour about wokeism and who was asked to define wokeism and it just stumped her. And so I've been working on a generous definition of wokeism. I, I want to give the the people who advocate it the benefit of the doubt in, in so far as I can. And I think the wokeism in generous terms is a cluster of advocacy positions that are designed to um, promote an understanding of and equity for historically marginalized people historically marginalized communities. And I think on that level, it's, it's impossible to object to it. It's the methodology by which that promotion proceeds that is the problem with wokeism, because wokeism is a religion. I completely agree with you on that. Um, the first time I heard it referred to that way, I think was Andrew Sullivan talking about the great awakening, which... I think it sets it in its past well. I think that's Iglesias who came up with that, but now everybody... It could, it could very well be. The first that's time right. I heard it was with Andrew Sullivan. Yeah. Um, but the, fundamentally, the methodology employed by the woke it is a um, sort of direct assault on the Enlightenment values of uh, rational inquiry, socio-religious tolerance, and individual rights. Um, Doing that um, puts it in a kind of position of um, bullying, uh, for lack of a for lack of a better term. Um, when you have decided that reason, that um, evidence, uh, objective evidence, and um, rational inquiry and standard modes of logic are not decisive in public discourse, then you are in a position of, I'm more powerful than you are, therefore I can take what I believe to be true and impose it upon you. And I think that that's the sort of underside of wokeism. It's the problematic side, the far more problematic side. Folks, we're talking to um, Mark Goldblatt, who teaches at the Fashion Institute of Technology, has written so many books it's embarrassing, and has written for every media organ in the business. Notice I say that as if this is a TV show 40 years ago where somebody <laughs> might be just doing it. Well, I'm appearing here with the supporting cast of the Bill Maher show now, so I feel, <laughs> I feel, honored, I feel honored about that. I just like the idea of pacing it that way, but Mark, this is the thing. Why are these people fighting the Enlightenment? Who does this? What makes them feel like they're on the side of the angels, these, these parishioners, which is indeed what they are? Why are they yeah. doing this? 
I think um, because arguing uh, on the basis of empirical evidence and logic is hard. And your side will not win if you don't have the best evidence and if you don't have a coherent logical approach. On the other hand, if sentiment is raised as a methodology to counter um, empirical evidence and standard logical modes, then anybody can play. And more importantly, uh, I think what that position, what the wokest position does, is it changes the nature of the search for truth. That is, it, it posits that the identity of the person making a truth claim is not only influences, but um, can guarantee the truth of the claim itself, that the truth value of a proposition is related to or a function of the identity of the speaker who makes the claim. But, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do the Glenn thing here. Yeah. I'm going to play the role of that kind of person. What mm -hmm. about my felt experience? I'm sitting here walking around behind my own eyes with my own memories, and I have felt the slings and arrows of outrageous microaggression, and I have listened to my, my forebears talking about experiences they had. And so, in a very essential way, I am what I feel because it would be unempirical for you to tell me that my feelings were not valid, especially since you haven't walked behind these eyes, you haven't been within this body and felt what I felt. And so, couldn't we say, Mark, that this is an advance on cold-hearted enlightenment thinking, that I have my own take on things based on what I have seen, and you can't fully understand it because you're not walking around behind my eyes. And you might even, even if it's understandable, you might have a certain resistance to understanding what it's like to walk around behind my eyes because you're white and you want to resist the guilt that might ensue if you acknowledge the sorts of things which I experience and see fully. Yeah, I think that's a perfect summary of the of the counter argument. And here's what I would here's how I would respond to that because it has been brought up. Um, if you tell me that there have been I don't know six violent crimes on your block over the last year. I have no basis from which to doubt that. Uh, if, you, if you make that claim, because I haven't been on your block, I, I haven't been tracking these kind of things, and just a, in conversational goodwill, I'd be inclined to accept it. On the other hand, if you go beyond the observation level and you start to interpret and analyze your experience, then I think it is the right of, of your interlocutor to begin to question that. So that if you say, well, there have been six violent crimes in my neighborhood and the police would not stand for that if my neighborhood were a different kind of neighborhood, that I think gets beyond just you are speaking from your experience. It, it involves you stepping out of your experience and making a comment on the world, which may not be justified on the basis of what you're seeing. In some ways, being up close and personal to six, to six violent crimes may make you a worse analyst of the causes and effects of it than uh, somebody who's looking at it from the outside. And again, the reason that's in it, that's a, um, and a direct assault on the Enlightenment intellectual tradition is you want to step outside of your subjectivity insofar as you can in order to arrive at um, solutions to collective problems. And I think that that is obviated by a woke position.